Psalm 13 is where we're at. We've been studying through this book. And I love the Psalms. How many enjoy reading the Psalms? Yeah, I'll tell you, if you need help, you need, uh, don't know what to say to the Lord, but need to cry out, I'll tell you, there's some heart cries in the book of Psalms. I say Proverbs helps you know how to live with man, and Psalms helps you know how to walk with God, how to live with God, how to, how to have a relationship with the Lord, and certainly you see that here. When was the last time you complained to God <laughs> about what he allowed to come in your life? Sometimes you're not sure, you know, to the devil. Is this something? I mean, here it is. It's in my life. But is this from the devil or did the Lord send it? If it is from the devil, God allowed it for a purpose, right? But either way, here it is to deal with, right? And uh, you find here in this psalm, here's a desperate man. He's someone that's at wit's end, especially in the beginning of the psalm. And, uh, but seasons of life change. That's, you know, one of the things about seasons. No matter how much you like that season, it's never that season forever. Um, it's true about fall or winter or spring. Some people love the fall. Certain things I like about fall. Certain things I like about spring. Certain things I like about winter. All that. And, uh, but there's different seasons in life, too. Uh, in this room, we've got a lot of seasons of life, right? Uh, people at different stages in their life. And as much as you enjoy your children at the exact stage they are now, they won't stay there, or your grandchildren, or whatever, right? Things are changing, and that's constant. And we see that in our life. Well, God has a purpose, though, in every season. And so it may be, this seems like a dark season, and God has a purpose for that. Um, David writes, like I said, in Psalm 13 here, from a desperation, from a place where he feels like, I can't go on. I don't know how to go on from this. Uh, John Phillips writes about this psalm. Most of us have been right there at some time or another. It may be a long drawn out sickness or a financial problem of great severity or long standing, difficult, tangled, seemingly hopeless. It may be a wayward son or daughter, an alcoholic spouse, an unsaved loved one, maybe a situation at work, a demanding, unreasonable boss, a jealous, spiteful co-worker. We'll probably find ourselves in David's shoes over and over again in life. Now that's encouraging, isn't it? <laughs> but it's true. I mean, the Bible says man has trouble as the sparks fly upward. The Bible says man that's born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. The fact is there's trouble in life, and the sooner you realize that you can't get away from trouble... But that rather you have someone that will go with you through that trouble, the better off you are, right? We want God to kill Pharaoh. <laughs> but God says, I'll go with you before Pharaoh, you know. Uh, we would like God to remove the lion's den and the fiery furnace, the valley of the shadow of death. But the Bible says that I'll be there in those places. Now, it's easy to talk about. It's another thing to recognize or realize and reckon it so in those times, but God will show up. And I believe when we're at wit's end, that is usually when God begins to work, when we come to the end of ourselves. It's funny, if you've walked with the Lord very long, you've probably found this to be true, that, well, let me just ask, when is it that you give the burden to the Lord? When is it that finally you'll give it to Him, this problem, this burden, you're ready to get help from God? Typically, it's not till it gets too heavy. As long as I can carry it, though I may be struggling, I'll carry it. But once it gets so heavy, I can no longer carry it. Now I'm ready to say, Lord, I've got to get help. Now I'd rather come to God, and we could come to God when it's light. <laughs> not too heavy, but typically in our human nature, that's the case. And you see here, before God does anything about our situation, I want you to know He wants to do something about ourselves. God allowed this season for a purpose, you know. It didn't just happen to think you rolled the dice or you, you, you pulled the straw and this is the, all right, you're going to get this problem. You know, oh, you get health problems. Oh, you get family problems. You, no, no, no. God's doing things with a purpose. We're not living by chance and circumstance and happenstance. Not at all. We have a Heavenly Father at work. You see, God wants 
to deal with us in a way that we don't want. We want God to deal with our complication. But God says, I want to do something about your character. I'm at work in your life. We want him to change our circumstance. He wants to change us. So he allowed this circumstances for that reason, see. That's why so often I say, Lord, I don't want to miss, I don't want to have to repeat, you know. (laughs) I don't want to miss the lesson here. Help me see so I don't have to go through another thing to learn this one. But we often cry, hurry up, Lord. Come on, Lord. How long? That's what we're going to see the psalmist cry. How long? And yet, God's saying, it's your move. I'm not going to move until you move. So here in Psalm 13, we have a man that is down in a horrible pit at first, and in the miry clay, and God reaches and takes him out, sets his feet upon a rock, and puts a new song in his heart by the end he's singing. So look at it with me. Psalm 13, verse, just six verses. Some kind of almost smile as they read this because the span roller coaster of emotions in six verses, you can read it in less than a minute. Let's read it together. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? We know that David would get comfort from God's countenance, the Lord's countenance. We looked at that in an earlier psalm. Now his face is hidden, it seems. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart, Daily, how long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord. Because he hath dealt bountifully with me. I'm bringing the title, Has God Forgotten You? Has God Forgotten You? Let's pray. Lord, help us now. Now, Father, in these next few minutes we have, would you unlock and open our eyes by your Spirit, the keys to Psalm 13, to help us to see what you want us to see, what You'd have us to learn. You, you promised that when you were gone, that you would send this comfort that would guide us into all truth. And so we're asking now that you would direct our eyes, our thoughts, that we would put aside everything else, and we would focus in and hear from heaven and be taught of thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We, we don't know exactly the specific background of this psalm, but we can probably guess multiple times in David's life, he was on the run, but for eight or nine years, he was hunted like an animal by by Saul. I mean, in caves, in forests, it was days, it turned to months, weeks, to months, to years. I mean, it got old. It's one thing to run for your life for a night, but I mean, for years, he could not go as he pleased. He was hiding in caves. Uh, He didn't know what was going to happen. At one point, he said, there's just a step between me and death. And this is the anointed king of Israel just waiting on Saul. It's time to end. And he's hunted like an animal. He's the hero of Israel. Killed Goliath. Yet, this is his lot, if you will. And so, he's saying, how long? Four times, these first few verses. How long? I mean, how long is this going to go on? It's interesting, God doesn't stop or spare in uh, teaching, in working on, in preparing his people. Uh, He's willing to take the time. Uh, He's not in a hurry when it comes to preparation. Um, We were taught in college that a call to preach or a call to ministry is a call to prepare. That you're never wasting time sharpening your axe, you know. And the Lord is... Interested. I mean, look at Moses. Moses, 40 years in, in, the, in the court in Egypt and 40 years in the backside of the desert, being prepared for the 40 years that he was going to lead God's people. God did not, was not bothered by the time spent in preparation. And, if, of course, if we would only get a hold of that, I uh, 
trying to encourage Brother Files, our, our missionary to Thailand. Here he is with his daughter named Kristen, similar age to our Kristen. Of course, that gets my, our attention, and she's got leukemia. It's cancer. You can only imagine the emotions they're dealing with. Here they are giving their life to God. They're going as missionaries to Thailand, just getting support, just about, and then, boom. In the last letter, he was discouraged. He wrote, he said, you know, if things don't change, you know, we may have to write and say, I guess God's closed the door for now because they, she needs immunizations before they can go. But she can't take the immunizations because of all the treatment. And it's just, you know, they're, they're hurting. And he feels guilty. We're taking support from churches. We can't go. And, of course, those are natural feelings. But the truth is, many times we think there's an expectation of what should happen and when. But God doesn't work on our timetable. And I want to encourage him by saying, hey, you don't know what God can do. God doesn't need years and years to do something. God in a moment can do something that we could labor for years and never accomplish. And so God doesn't work like we work, and, and we have an expectation. And, and here's David saying, look, I was anointed years ago to be king. Now, I had Saul in, in my grasp. I cut a piece of his robe off. I could have killed him, but Lord, I waited on you. And here Saul's doing wrong, and, and, and it seems like nothing's happening. I'm doing good, and I'm being treated like an animal. We can imagine that, right? So number one, just want you to see, first, the first two verses, we see the inward struggle. The biggest problem all of us have is our self, right? The inward struggle, the struggle we have to conquer self. That's the difficult one. And we see him dealing with his feelings here. How long? Four times in two verses, mark them. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? He feels like he's for, forgotten by the time you finish verse 2. He feels like he's been forsaken. How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? God promised David the throne, yet seemed further and further away. Saul's doing evil. How come you're not judging him? How come I feel like I'm abandoned? He's disturbed about what the enemy's doing, but he's more concerned and disturbed that it seems like God's not doing anything. And that's where he's at. I love it with David. God's just honest about where David's feeling. We can all, uh, if you've been there, you know, you can sympathize with his emotions. He feels deserted. Feels like God's ignoring him. Feels like God's hiding from him, he says. How long are you going to hide their face? Verse 2, it says, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? It's like David's trying to devise ways to overcome this enemy but nothing seems to satisfy. Let me remind you, faith is living life without scheming. Faith is living without scheming. Without trying to figure it out on your own and come up with your own plan, but rather, Lord, I don't have any plan. <laughs> I don't know any plan. Lord, I want you to guide me. That's, what, that's where Solomon was. Lord, I, I don't know how to go out and come in. I'm not like a child. I, I'd get out, go out this door and just never find my way back. I need you to take my hand and guide me. We, we need to recognize our need of him. That means, by the way, faith without, is living without scheming. That means not leaning on our own experiences or our own skills. No, I have experience in this. I think I know what to do. Don't lean on that. Trying to plot your own schedule of how to make this work. But rather, faith is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. My mom's life verse is, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Not your experience, not what you read in some article. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path, right? You see, yeah, storm clouds are everywhere in sight in David's viewpoint. But the sun's still shining. It's just back behind the clouds. It's kind of like the song we sang tonight, right? Beulah land. <laughs> far away. Far below the storm of doubt, verse 2 says. Upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle on the enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me. Tis Beulah land. It's not heaven he's talking about only. He's talking about being with God, the presence of God. It's bad out in the world, but I'm telling you, I can get with God and be... 
in his presence like it's heaven. He says in verse 3, let the stormy breezes blow. Their cry cannot alarm me. I'm safely sheltered here, protected by God's hand. Here, the sun is always shining. Here, there's not can harm me. I'm safe forever in beautiful land. I'm living on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky. I'm drinking the fountain that never shall run dry. I say, well, that sounds like some utopia. That just, he must be talking about heaven. Well, certainly it, it would refer to heaven, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying with God, though it's wars and bombs flying, and though there's a trouble at every hand, though you're being hunted like an animal like David, there is help to be found in the presence of God. But he has to overcome this inward struggle. Remember, it's dangerous to give in to feelings. Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible tells us, right? Our heart is deceitful above all things. You'll lie. Your heart will lie to you. Your feelings will lie to you. Your emotions will overcome you. And uh, it's desperately wicked, right? Who can know it? We can't, but the Lord knows. I think about Hannah in the Bible. Here's a, a woman whose husband sinned, and the sin is causing great turmoil in the home. You say, what's the sin? Well, he disobeyed God about marriage. He has two wives. Because of that, the one has children is mocking the other that does. And of course, in that day, that was a big deal. Not that it always isn't a big deal, but especially then. And so here's Hannah broken, weeping at the temple. The other wife is being ugly, just hateful about it. She's just broken, crying. And then God breaks through, right? Samuel is given, and, and this is the great prophet of, of Israel. And two books of the Bible carry his name. And our God's great. Our God is, is, is able, right? Jacob. Here, Jacob had lost Joseph, he thought. They go to get corn in Egypt, and they come back, and here's another one of his boys gone. Now he's being held hostage, Simeon. Oh, no. We've got to take Benjamin. If we don't take Benjamin, we can't get Simeon back and we'll get no more corn. Oh, no. Can't do it. And this is Genesis 42, 36. You can read it for yourself later. But basically, here's what Jacob says. Everything is against me. Everything's against me. Well, you know the story. That wasn't the case at all. God was working for him like it hadn't been in years. He's about to find out Joseph's alive, about to move in from famine in Israel to, to Goshen, where it's, it's a great place to live in Egypt, the best place of Egypt. About to be reunited with his boy that he loves so much, Joseph. But he says, everything's against me. Well, that wasn't true, but his feelings lied to him, said. And you know the feeling. You know that knot in your stomach when something's just not right and you just can't shake it? You go to bed thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. Uh, you try to concentrate on something that just keeps coming to mind, this ache, this thing that you're dealing with. What do you do? Now, David's going to learn to replace this question, how long, with what he says in Psalm 31. Look over there, Psalm 31, verse 15. The Bible says in Psalm 31, 15, he's dealing with trouble again. But he says, my times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from that, them that persecute me. Rather than how long, he says, my times are in thy hand. Lord, I'm yours. I'm your servant. Do whatever you have with me. I'm just wanting to be wherever you want me to be. My will, I resign to your will. I hear people in their 70s and 80s say, Pastor, I didn't think I'd deal with this. I, I didn't think this would be something I'd have to deal with at this age. Job 14.1 says, Man, is born a woman, is a few days and full of trouble. There's just troubles. There's no escaping trouble in this life. But the real victory is not found in the absence of trouble finding that place where there's no trouble, the real victory is found in the presence of God. Amen. And so learning to find the Lord in the midst of the storm. Jesus didn't come walking on the water when the water was like glass. He came walking on the water when it was boisterous, windy, such a storm where these fishermen that were experienced sailors thought they were going down and going to die. 
That's when he came. Now, when he got in the boat, he made it like glass. But it wasn't like that when he got there. Remember this verse when you're in trouble like this. Isaiah 49, 15, 16. Can a woman forget her sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Before you answer that, be careful. I mean, our knee-jerk reaction is, no mother could forget her child. Uh, No mother could forget a little baby like that. But we read about in the news people that leave their baby in the car on purpose, kill their child, all kinds of things in our day people will do. I mean, our our, our human nature would say, no, no one would. And the natural thing, uh, people wouldn't. But our wicked world, things happen. This is what God says, yea, they may forget. Wow, that's a rare thing. Yet will I not forget thee. Hey, before I'll ever forget you, mothers will forget their babies. Verse 16 says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. We are actually written on the palm of his hands. Makes me think of the nail scars, doesn't you? Our name. Oh, are those scars on your hands? Well, there are, but our names are written in his hand, the Bible says. Pretty amazing. See, God hasn't forgotten you. God allows things at times to compel us to, to search for him, but he hasn't forgotten us. I'm grateful I don't live like I did when I was growing up in the day where we just had house phones. Because if I ever tried to call from here to get my family, I'm about to have three teenage girls before too long. And my wife... I'd never get through, right? It'd be busy signal all the time. How long? <laughs> How long? But come with me to another place. Go to an olive yard here. See this man with eight of his friends a little further away, and three closer. One's already gone off to sell them for the price of a servant. Watch him plead with them, would you watch and pray with me one hour? And then him leave and go and plead with the Lord, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Matthew 26, 36 to 46, you read this passage. He, he's in agony. He, he prays these words. In fact, three times he'd pray the same words. You say, well, I thought that's vain repetition. No, no, this was true agony. Here, the psalmist is praying similar words, but he's not repeating something that's meaningless. No, no, he's praying, talking to God. Here, he comes back to these men. It's not the thought of death that's crushing him. It's the thought of his God being abandoned by God. God turns back on God. This cup he's worried about here in Gethsemane, he takes the first sips of that dreadful cup. What happens? Well, the last time he comes to his friends, they're so asleep that he wakes them. The Bible says it's like they're in a stupor, not not because of drunk, but just drunk with sleep. You've heard that term. They're in a stupor and they blink at him. You can imagine the Bible says they knew not what to answer him. They're just so overcome with sleep. (coughs) So he head, heads back the third time to that tear-drenched spot. Begins to pour out his heart to God again. I just want to say, look, when we find ourselves there, let's remember that he, our great high priest, knows that spot well. He knows the place where it seems that God had abandoned him. Right? He cried on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? He knows what that feels like. And we always must remember that God is never in a hurry to do the work that he wishes to accomplish in us. Our task is to let him work, to allow him to do what work he wants to do in us, to bring us through this season. I remember going to visit the Corvette factory in uh, Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky. We took a field trip there when I was first out of college, and two years I was in Kentucky there as assistant pastor, and we took our students to the school there, and, and uh, some of them got to beat the horn at the end and got to sign the birth certificate of it, and it's pretty cool, but 
<clears throat> you watch this factory and it's all automated, all these things going on. And uh, it, it, you think, wow, this is the like height <clears throat> of man's engineering, producing this at the quickest way you could. You know, the first step they learned, right, is that one guy shouldn't build a car, all the pieces, but they all should do just one thing and do it well, and then it goes down the line, right? But if you watch the car, that thing is, I mean, it's the fastest, it's the speed of human engineering, the quickest it could be done, that thing is crawling. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's on a belt, and it is moving, but it's at a snail's pace, and they're doing their work as it moves down the conveyor belt, you know? But it's moving so slow. You know, and it's finally getting to the next spot, and they're working as it moves, and they have to have their job done, right, before it gets to the next spot. And um, it was interesting. But, hey, they're making a great machine. This is something that is going to be awesome. It's a Corvette, right? But it takes a certain amount of time. I mean, it doesn't happen just like that. Well, God's working on our soul. God's doing soul work and work that can't be done on the mountaintop. We need the valley. There's things we've got to get there, right? He's wanting to fine-tune our life so we can bring more glory to Him, so we can be used and usable by Him. And God knows what He's doing. He has something to teach us. He's at work. So there's the inward. That's the inward look of what's happening. An inward struggle with our feelings these next two are brief, and we'll be through. Number two, we see the outward danger. So he deals with his feelings. Now he has to deal with his foes. Verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. And the key word here is lest. Twice he repeats it, lest. Look, it's good to have peace within, but you also need a protection from without. And that's what David's saying here. Lord, I'm going to die under this heavy load. You ever feel like that? Lord, I can't make it another step. It's going to crush me. It's, I'm going to sleep the sleep of death. This thing's going to kill me. And David felt if, if he fell asleep, maybe they'd literally find him and kill him so he couldn't fall asleep lest they kill him while he's sleeping. I'll tell you one thing. When you're... When mind and body is weary like he's talking about there, it's even easier to be discouraged. Now look, I know we need the Lord and we need prayer and we ought to get there. This is where we'll find rest for our soul. But honestly, there are times you just need a nap. I mean, physically, you've got to get sleep. I mean, you've got to take care of the body. Um, the Scottish preacher, uh, Robert Murray McShane, died in his early 30s. And this is what he said. He said, God gave me a horse to ride and a message to deliver. I've killed the horse and I can no longer deliver the message. He's talking about his body. I mean, you've got, you've got to sleep. You've got to get sleep. I'm not talking about being lazy and, and there's Proverbs who talk about uh, slumber and sleep. But you have, it's easy to be discouraged when you're wore out, right? So sometimes you need that. Certainly we need the soul rest that only God's word and prayer can bring. No amount of sleep can bring rest to your soul. Like I said, you can go to bed thinking about the problem and wake up thinking about it. And wake up with a headache. I don't know why I woke up with a headache this morning. I still got a headache. When I push right now, my voice is coming up the back of my head. You know? And uh, Mary said, take some. But I'm stubborn and don't take anything. But it's just all day sometimes you don't have rest from that by sleeping sometimes. It wakes up with you. What do you need? You need the Lord. There's an outward danger here. His foes are wanting to come on him. Interesting, the first two verses is almost like a plea. But three and four, he's turning it to a prayer. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. See, God wants our plea to become a prayer. And God's waiting for our plea to become a prayer. It's interesting if you study what it means where he says, O Lord, my God. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Jehovah God. And then he says, oh Lord, my God, he's, that's Elohim. Jehovah, he's saying, God, my promise keeper, the God of promise, that's who Jehovah was. Then Elohim is the God of power. 
I have a God that will keep his word and a God that is the God of power that is able. Look, hey, whoa, stop everything. David is the anointed king. It doesn't matter what Saul does. God said David would be the king and would sit on the throne. And David, you're not the king yet. Somehow, some way, God's going to bring you to the throne. You're going to be king just like God said. And so he could rest that I have a covenant promise keeping God and he'll keep his promise. If I obey him and follow him, he's going to do what he promised he'd do. And not only that, he's got the power to bring it to pass. Saul's no match for him. God's able. So Saul could never win. David was going to reign. There's nothing Saul could do no matter what. So David had to nail his emotions to the cross, if you would, nail his emotions to the Word of God saying, I'm not going to allow my heart to deceive me. I'm not going to let my emotions deceive me. I'm going to hold to the truth that my God, oh Lord, my God, oh Lord, my God, promise-keeping God, powerful God. That's what Lord and God there means. Jehovah, Elohim. See, prayer brought a new dimension into the picture. It didn't matter how long he figured on that equation. It wasn't going to come out good. He didn't have the numbers, okay? But when he began to look to God, God was able and God was enough. Verse 4, it says, Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I moved. He was concerned, interesting, even in this, where he, he, he thinks he's about to die and all this, he's worried about God's glory. Lest my enemies say, Lord, what will happen to your name? They know I'm the anointed king and they know I'm your servant. What will happen to your name if something happens to me? He's worried about God's glory. These dark hours are required to bring us to a place of dependence upon God. We turn to him when our burden gets greater than we can bear. And God fully knows what He's doing. God is at work. He's waiting for us to cry out to Him. He's waiting for us to come to Him for help. When will we? You know, it's our nature. We want people to know about it. (laughs) You know, I want people to know I'm having a hard time. And I'm not saying there's not people you ought to go to for prayer and certain things, but sometimes we just want people to know, you know, I'm really having it tough. And so people have sympathy. But God's waiting for you to come to Him with it. We want other people to know so they can give us that sympathy and that's just in our nature. But God's saying, come to me. I'm waiting for you to cry out and give me glory. I'm going to be with you in that trial. Thirdly, not only the inward and the outward, but the upward look. You see his feelings, the first two verses. Then you see his foes, but verses 5 and 6, you see his faith. The key word here is but. I love it, verse 5. But... I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. You see a transition here from fear to faith. I've trusted in you. It's not that I I, I one day in the past trusted. I'm trusting you now. And this salvation wasn't exciting 28 years ago when I got saved. It's exciting now. The Lord is my salvation. I'm going to rejoice in that. He goes from questioning to how long to claiming God's promises. He says here that I have trusted thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I'll sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. His feelings had been a roller coaster, but God was still on the throne. His character had not changed one bit. God would not fail. It never would fail. And God's people, we don't live on explanations. If God did step down and explain why you're going through everything you're going through, it really wouldn't help you. Because it's not the explanation that will get you through. It's the faith in the God that is the one taking care and the one providing. That's where the help is. We live on promises, not on explanations. And those promises are as unchanging as the character of God. He comes from tears here uh, to to truth. And then finally here he's singing. Here's triumph, right? All in one short six-verse psalm. Notice salvation there. Don't miss that. Salvation. Someone said, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. He's talking about salvation from sin. I'd say yes. 
I'll tell you tonight, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, He wants to save you from your sins. Before long, we'll be reading the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1. They said they'll call him his name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. No, Jesus means Savior. It means Jehovah is salvation. I want you to know the Lord Jesus wants to save you from your sins. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, if you've never received Christ your Savior, if you die, you'd go to hell. That's what the Bible says. And the Lord doesn't want you to go there. That's why He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. And He took your pain. He took your punishment. He drank the cup of our wickedness. The sin and God's wrath rolled on him on the cross and was buried. He rose again. The Bible says if you'll believe that and receive him, God will save you by faith in him. You say, well, is it salvation from a sin? Yes. Well, is it salvation from self and his feelings? I'd say yes. Is it, <laughs> what about salvation from Satan? Yes, the Lord will help you. What about salvation from Saul? Yeah. In this case, yes. See, salvation, God comes and helps us in all these things. See, relying on the Lord, though, brings rejoicing. By the end, he's singing. (laughs) I can hear Caitlin every time someone reads Psalm 100. That's where uh, Chase preached from on Sunday night. But when she was a little girl, since she's not in here, I'll say it. She had it, but she memorized it. We'd have her quote it. Mary would teach them all with actions, with all those cute things, you know. And she'd say, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. That's how Mary taught her to say it, you know. (laughs) And I can hear it every time I hear that psalm read. But I tell you, there's power when you sing to God. Not singing for someone else to hear, and not singing just so it sounds really good necessarily. That's not your real concern. You're singing to the Lord. You're singing out of a heart that's bountiful of the Lord. He says he had dealt bountifully with me. Bountifully. Oh. You know, it's one thing for God to deal with you. It's another thing for him to deal bountifully with you. So what does bountiful mean? It means f- it's focused. The word focused on the goodness of God. It's generosity with God's people. Notice the end here. By the end, God's close. I mean, in the beginning, he felt like he was so far away. Where is God? I can't find him. He's hiding his face. But at the end, he's saying, I'll sing unto the Lord because he dealt bountifully with me. Verse 5, but I've trusted in thy mercy. I, in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Things have been reconnected here. I'm going to sing and God's going to hear me. He's close. The Bible says he's nearer than our next breath. God's close by. God's near. Verse 6, he said, I'll sing unto the Lord. Why? Why, David? Why are you going to sing? Because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You notice the past tense? Isn't that interesting? Has David's actual immediate circumstances changed? No. (laughs) I mean, he's praying. He's crying out to God. He's talking from this cave, potentially, somewhere. No, it hasn't changed. Is Saul dead? No. Did he get some news in that a new shipment of arms have come in for him, new weapons? No. What's changed? What's the difference? David's circumstances haven't changed, but the Lord's changed him. As he went to the Lord, the Lord has helped him to see the truth that God has not changed at all. I'm still what I was when you defeated Goliath and I met you there on that battlefield. I'm still the same God that helped you defeat the Philistines. I am the great I am. David stopped looking, see, at his feelings, and he stopped looking at his foes, but rather, by faith, started looking to God, the one that was able. David's geographical location didn't change. He's not on the throne yet, but it didn't need to change. What needed to change is he had to put his faith in the Lord. Uh, He says, but, verse 5, but I have trusted in thy mercy. And my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord. He's taking over his emotions. He's taking control of his soul. I will sing unto the Lord because he had dealt bountifully with me. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. 
even our faith. It's not the victory that you have in hand. No, no, it's your faith in God who has the victory. God wants our plea to become a prayer, and then now we're able to praise him. And that's exactly what happens. He can sing because God hasn't changed. His gaze has changed. First, he had to look, he's looking inward. <laughs> and then he's looking outward at the foes, but finally now he's looked upward. And my God's able. The Lord's able here. So has God forgotten us? How can a child of God sing in the devil's land by faith? This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. A salvation is wonderful right now, in the present, not just way back then. It's wonderful now. My God is the God of my salvation. Every one of us needs to go from in this psalm, from how long? Oh, Lord, how long am I going to deal with this? How long am I going to deal with this person? How long am I going to deal with this job? How long am I going to deal with this bill? How long to the end where it says, He hath dealt bountifully with me. He's dealt bountifully with me. What a God. Let's bow in prayer, may we?